of debate is that if we become too bogged down in practical concerns of how we are going to do something, we often miss the point about why we are going to do it. Why is the single most important question we didn't ever ask of any policy, of any argument put forward by our leaders, by our governments, by institutions who demand our trust automatically. We should question why we trust them in the first place, why we believe their information, but more importantly, why what they advocate is something that we should also believe in. What are the justifications, the philosophical ideas that underpin a particular course of action? Discovering those in your debates is often the key to deepening the analysis that you give. It's also very much the key to linking your arguments both to each other and to the overall value that you're trying to promote as a proposition or an opposition. Sometimes the principles to be debated are principles which both sides seek to claim. Then it becomes easy for the judges to analyse how those arguments clash. Other times, it may be the case that there are in fact competing principles. This is certainly true of some value debates where the clash of principles is explicit. The most common example of this is the debate about security versus liberty. There is very often a trade-off between those two values. We need to determine which, if any, we should prioritize over the other in the vast majority of cases. Remembering all the time that our burden is never to show that a principle is absolute, because all principles are conditional. They are conditional on their effect on individuals, and conditional on the impact they have on those individuals' ability to act and function as the citizens that we would like them to be. That means, potentially, that some principles may always be more important than others. Some principles are subordinate. They feed greater principles. We may believe, for example, that freedom is important. But we need to question whether freedom is the goal in and of itself, or whether allowing individuals to be free enables them to be something more, something better, that we think is even more significant. The idea that as a citizen within a mature democracy, we are responsible for that democracy. That we uphold things like values of truth, justice, fairness, rights provision. All these things go to making what we might consider a better society. But it's how we define for ourselves and others how that better society looks <coughs> that is important. One of the easiest ways of defining something is to determine what it is not. Okay? By looking at the things which distinguish that value from other elements in our society. It can be very, very hard to give a definition of something abstract that is also concrete. It can be very easy to point to the things where we say, well, there is a lack of liberty, there is a lack of engagement, there is a lack of enfranchisement, without clearly defining what we mean by those terms liberty, engagement, and enfranchisement. Equally, sometimes we might think we are claiming a principle within a debate, but in reality we're not doing very much at all. It is perhaps a truism of political theory that the value of any statement can be calculated by the simple formation of its antithesis. That means, create the opposite statement 
and see what value that has. Politicians often fall into this trap. We hear politicians in elections all the time say that they want improved living standards for citizens. Well, yes, pretty much everybody does. I can't conceive of a politician standing up and saying that honestly he wants living standards to go down because that would be good for people. We hear politicians say we want people to have more liberty. Again, yes, your opponent is never going to claim that less liberty is probably a good thing. Except in a debate about liberty and security, obviously. <laughs> so what I'm going to do in the next 40 minutes or so is we're going to look at the three debates you've conducted already to try to determine what principles might be at stake in the debate, whether some principles are indeed subordinate to others, whether some principles are principles that can be shared or can be claimed by both sides, or whether, strategically, it might be more important to find competing principles that fall on either side and see how those attach. So the first practice debate you did was one about direct democracy being required at a local level. Now, to a large degree, the debate suffered from a lack of identification of the value that we were trying to instill or uphold. The group I worked with in my brainstorming session had a very, very clear idea of where they wanted to take the debate in either direction. If you're on the proposition in this debate, what is it about direct democracy that you think is good? Does somebody want to tell me? I know some of you know this because we discussed it before the debate. More freedom. Okay? So we might think freedom is important. But the question is, why do we want more freedom for our citizens? Do we just like freedom? Like chocolate? More chocolate is better, therefore more freedom is better. Because we experience a democratic deficit. Stick to the idea of freedom. How does freedom and democratic deficit tie in together, or, do, or don't they? Is that a separate idea? Okay, so if it's a separate idea, we'll come back to it. Yeah, but that's an explanation of freedom. It doesn't tell me why freedom matters. Mia? Uh, democracy is about giving, having freedom of choice, and if we are limiting that freedom, that's uh, how the freedom and the um, deficit in democracy can be connected. Okay, so democracy is about freedom of choice. <coughs> All that tells me is that if we increase the freedom, we increase or we strengthen the democracy. It doesn't tell me why either of those things is good. Yeah? Increasing freedom increases responsibility, which in turn may, with an increase of freedom of choice, better the choice we make. Okay, now we might be getting somewhere. An increase in freedom correlates or is equivalent to an increase in responsibility. So we've now moved on from the idea that freedom is a good in and of itself to the idea that freedom creates responsible citizens. Why are responsible citizens better citizens then? That they understand politics more and what's going on within their country so they can focus on particular issues that they may not have known about before. Okay, so more responsibility means better understanding of issues that people face. And when we have better understanding of the issues we face, what does that mean for us as voters? We make better choices. We make better choices, right. And that gives us better choices. <coughs> we 
We're finally getting to an idea that freedom is a means to a further goal. Freedom is a means to more informed and therefore better choices within a democracy. People choose to engage on a more significant level. So we might start with the idea that we like freedom, work through those principles to this idea of choices being better, and decide that ultimately that is the value that we want to uphold. In a democracy, in order for a democracy to function well, as a mature democracy, we think citizens, Mr. Speaker, should be informed, should be responsible, and should be able to make the best choice possible. We think all of those are fed by direct democracy. Because they encourage better engagement. They encourage our citizens to gather more information, to know more about the issues that they face. We think informed citizens always make better choices, Mr. Speaker. And that is what we want. We want better citizens. Our definition of a better citizen is an informed, responsible and active citizen. We think that is promoted by a model of direct democracy. We have a clear and firm value that we have established on-site government. We have a clear principle that democracy makes citizens better. More able to take control of their own lives. Less dependent on state resources and state assistance, perhaps. That might give us other values that we seek to promote. Individuals who are responsible, individuals who are active, individuals who are informed, tend to be less of a burden on each other. We have a community that is stronger because it is less burdensome. We have a society that functions better, that is more stable. We have better use of resources. All of these stem from our principle working through to our idea of better choices. So very often in your brainstorming session, the first principle you identify won't be the principle that you choose to uphold in the debate. It may be a stepping stone to that principle. What you need to do is think clearly about what it is about democracy that we think is good. Very often as judges we hear, oh, well, you know, this is good because it's more democratic. So, sometimes people make terrible choices. I don't think democracy is necessarily always a good thing. Okay? If 51% of the population decide that ginger people are the problem, that's democratic. It's probably not a good decision. Certainly not for me, because when I do have hair, it tends to be a bit ginger. <laughs> That's why I chose baldness. It was, you know, either or. But ultimately, democracy is never a good in and of itself, because we all know about the possibility of what we call the tyranny of the majority. Majoritarian rule is not always moral. Direct democracy, however, encourages and perhaps demands of our citizens that they take more responsibility for their actions. That they make better decisions and they can only do that by becoming more informed about situations. It also, in order to feed these better choices, might demand of our political class that they inform us better. That they make more effort to communicate their message rather than relying on the standard loyalties that party politics creates. If I only vote once a year and I vote for a political party in a representational democracy, I tend to delineate my choice with broad brushstrokes. I'm either broadly left-wing or broadly right-wing or broadly moderate and centrist. Not every one of my ideas will be contained within any one of those three broad political positions. I choose the one that is the least worst fit for me. And then I abdicate my responsibility and I let the Labour Party or the Conservative Party make those choices on my behalf. Now that doesn't mean 
that I have any incentive to inform myself about day-to-day -day situations because that decision is taken out of my hands. Equally, the two political or three political parties in the mainstream have no incentive to explain to me the situation because they are making the decision on my behalf. In a direct democracy, I force those people to campaign better because they require my vote in order to get things done. So I increase the flow of information. And I'm back to this idea that a more informed citizen is a better citizen because they make better choices. So my principle ultimately might be information good. More information better. Direct democracy demands more information. I can choose to frame my principle in different ways depending on how I want my arguments to flow. It might be easier for me to link back to the value of better citizens rather than better information. Why? Because information is an abstract concept. Citizens are human beings. I can relate to an individual human being. I can't relate to a piece of knowledge. Okay? One of the debates I've enjoyed most in my career as a debater was a debate about state provision of pension rights. And I was in a room, it was a very, very high level debate, it was at the World Championships, and I was in a room with a team from Harvard who were postgraduate economists, and a team from Yale who were postgraduate economists, and a team from Princeton who were postgraduate economists. And they all had decided that this was an economics debate. And I knew nothing about economics, I still don't. I basically know about supply and demand curves, and that's about as far as my economic knowledge goes. And so they set up this debate which talked about the economic coercion on the state, of providing these pensions, how this was damaging to economy and growth as a whole. And I didn't really understand any of it, because they used a lot of macroeconomic terms that I'd never come across. But fortunately, I knew one thing that those three teams didn't. And that was none of the judges was a postgraduate economist. But all of the judges were human beings. Oddly, I know, that happens sometimes. <laughs> so when I stood up in second opposition, I said, Madam Speaker, I have a confession to make. Don't know anything about economics. Can't really rebut what the government side have said. I didn't really understand it. But I don't think this is a debate about economics. I think it's a debate about people. And I think it's a debate about when people are made a promise by their government that if they work hard and pay into a system, they have a reasonable expectation of being looked after when they get older. I don't think that's a stretch, Madam Speaker. I think that's what this debate's always been about. And what we should really be talking about is the effect of this policy on people. I don't care about the effect of this policy on interest rates because I don't understand them, but neither do most people. We can all relate to individuals and linking your principle back to people is always stronger in the minds of most judges than linking it back to abstract concepts like economic growth. Because the one thing those teams in that debate failed to show me was why growth was always a good thing. Because if I understand growth properly in economic terms, it means prices go up. Inflation is part of economic growth. To me, that doesn't sound good, unless the money in my pocket also goes up. But as a pensioner, that's less likely to happen. Because I don't get salary increases in line with that inflation. So I'm much more concerned about the effect on me as an individual and on the people around me than I am about the effect on numbers issued by a central bank. My principle should always be about people, not about abstracts. So that's the proposition side in this debate. Do the opposition claim the same thing? No. Why not? They will lose. <laughs> well, yes, they will. But why will they lose? Or, or they can say that so they will have they will make better choices, but through representative democracy as well. They could. 
claim better choices come through representative democracy. And they can provide analysis that seeks to demonstrate that. That one of the opportunities we have in a representational democracy is the ability for expert consultation because large populations generally cannot understand all the complex information they need to in order to make informed choices. Okay? So it becomes about not the choices that the individual makes, but it becomes about the choices government make. So my principle on the opposition might be better choices, but that might be difficult for the judges to see how individual better choices arise when proposition have done a pretty good job of showing that they flow from a concept of direct democracy. What I might want to say is, Government isn't about empowering individuals all the time. I give a different construction or a different conception of what government means. Government to me, on the opposition, good governance is efficient. It's able to take views that individuals can't. It is broad in its scope. It views things in the long term and it takes an approach that includes everybody. What's good for me, the individual, might not be good for Ray down here, might not be good for Raul here. As a government, they have to choose something that is good for all three of us, or possibly the least worst option for all three of us. So good governance might not be about the individual, but might be about the macro level. That's certainly my contention on opposition. Good governance is efficient, good governance is broad in scope, where individual choices tend to be narrow, and good governance has a long-term focus where my individual choice is necessarily short-term. So I contrast the type of choices that are made through a representational democracy and compare those to the type of choices made in a direct democracy. I then have clashing principles. One is individual freedom leading to responsibility and the individual's ability to make a better choice versus the correlative, which is the individual choice might not always be right for the collective. And then I've got a proper debate happening with, between my competing principles. We are both ultimately striving for better government of a kind. But we have different conceptions of how that better government is for. Easy for both sides then to discover arguments that fit in with those overall positions. When you're brainstorming, very often you don't start from finding your principles. You might start from thinking about the types of arguments you could run, seeing which are easiest to fit together, and then seeing how the principle is derived from those arguments, work backwards in that sense. When you draw a picture of a house, very often we start at the top and work down. But when you build a house, you start from the foundations and work up. Rationalising backwards in that sense, discovering your arguments, deciding which arguments you want to run, deriving your principle from that, and then deriving your model from the principle and the arguments you choose that uphold it, very often gives you a stronger, more cohesive case. Okay, so that's direct democracy. That's only one potential conception of that debate, but it shows you how, on either side, it should be relatively easy for the sides to determine the principles that exist. Local food. What's the debate about? about food produced locally and whether it's good or bad for people, because people matter, things don't, okay? But what people are we talking about? Who are the people involved? This is another way to define what your principle might be. Look for the stakeholders. Now, if we should encourage or wherever possible people should eat food produced at the local level, who's that going to impact upon? 
what sort of impact is it going to create? Who are the groups of people we need to consider as being most directly affected by our policy or by our normative stance? So who, who do we affect? Lizzie? The local community, first and foremost. The people who are going to be buying the local food. Who else? Farmer. Farmers, people who produce the food. Who else? Uh, farmers, uh, the import, the farmers who the food. Okay. Importers and exporters who might lose business. <laughs> who else? Um, like major companies. Okay. Big food companies. Those could be supermarkets, fast food chains, companies that produce convenience food, Dr. Oetker's frozen pizzas and the like. Who else? Government. Government. Who else? citizenry. We've got the people who produce the food, presumably that's also locally. We've got importers and exporters. We've got big food companies. We've got government. Can you think of anybody else? Dorian? Animals. Animals, yeah, to a degree. Do, are we as concerned with animals as we are with people? No. 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 And don't say yes just because you're vegetarian. <laughs> They are still in the hierarchy of stakeholders, some way below. Foreign people, those who are producing food now, like the Chinese people or the Bangladesh people. Okay, so we've got producers in developing countries who might suffer. And it is almost exclusively developing countries. I know that Slovenia has a particularly large market in sweet corn, but you know, it is generally producers in developing countries who rely almost exclusively on their ability to export at a cheaper price to maintain competitive advantage and things like that. But that excludes what we call cash crop economies. That is, economies such as the coffee producing nations of Central and South America and Africa, where that produce generally cannot be grown in a large variety of environments. So cocoa, coffee, things like that, tend not to be affected by local food movements. We've got a pretty good list of stakeholders there. If we're on side proposition, i.e. we're the side saying we should eat local food, who are the people that we are trying to assist or help through our policy? Local producers. Local producers. Local community. Government also. Government? Possibly. Animals? Possibly. I'm going to leave those to the other box. But those are the people that we want to help. In what ways? Are we trying to help them? What do we think are the benefits of local food specifically to our top two stakeholders? Uh, local producers have a larger impact and therefore... Uh, what is the impact on them, um, principally? Their products are now uh, on shelves uh, more, more often and yep. they gain more, more money from that. So it's an economic impact? Yes. So largely speaking, the effect on producers is an economic impact. They have an increased market for their produce, because at the moment, locally produced food tends to get sold in a farmer's market once a week. If we encourage people to eat more local food, that presumably means that there will be more local food available in things like supermarkets. <coughs> what about our local consumers? 
the impact on them economic? No. no. Good. Well, to an extent, because local food is a lot more expensive. Right. And uh, but if we say that local food food is not the genetically modified one, it is good to uh, how do you say that? Like for the longer period of time, because well, it doesn't give you cancer. <laughs> so that's a <laughs> health benefit. So the major impact might not be economic; it might be health. Okay. So there we've got two different principles that both fall on size proposition. One might be the economic principle that we seek to support local food producers over and above those large industrial producers that supermarkets tend to favour because the raw materials, the cost price is cheaper. And we think local producers might, but not necessarily, are more likely to use farming techniques and things like that because small-scale farms require fewer pesticides. So that's better for the health of the local community, but also be better for what? Environment. Environment. <laughs> right, so we've now got a third principle. Environment. We might need to decide, as side government, which of those principles we think is most important? What is the duty of government in this debate? Is it to promote healthy consumption? Is it to provide an economic environment in which our local producers can thrive? Or is it to have regard to long-term effects of things like pesticide on the natural environment? It might be all three. Because all three of these things make life better for our citizens. Okay? There's a correlative to that though, in that making life better for our citizens might do what? Make life worse. Exactly. Make life worse for other people. Principally who? The countries. Do we really care about McDonald's? No, no good. They're not in our principle. McDonald's get harmed, boo-hoo. Cry me a river, build me a bridge, then get over it. But producers in developing countries, oh, those are people we probably should care about. Those are people we probably should care about. Why? Uh, I disagree, personally. <laughs> You're free to disagree? Which bit do you disagree I with? I don't think that most of the food that we eat cannot be produced like locally. So, I mean, no, no, I didn't mean to say that. Most of the food that's produced in developing countries that are that's imported are, is not something that we, first of all, need to be locally. Second of all, so it's not harming like the majority of the developing countries. That's what I'm to say. Well, I've already said we exclude things like cash crop economies. Obviously, bananas can't grow everywhere. Um, coffee and chocolate being the two principal cash crop economies of the world. But what about producers who rely on a competitive advantage to produce the things that Europe can produce but doesn't because you can buy them cheaper elsewhere? That happens because of the status quo. Like there's a situation where you expect something cheaper so that it's not whatever. Yeah, but our expectation of something cheaper is not necessarily the principle that we're seeking to uphold here. Okay? Yeah, yeah, but... Yeah. So, yeah, we are... Actually, also, um, in developing countries, they can, um, in most countries, they can produce food in different times. Uh, something in the UK is asparagus, because this asparagus season is about two months ago. But that in itself might not be a bad thing. There's basically two things on that point. When we're talking about the moshi itself, it says whenever possible. And second, do you really need to eat asparagus throughout the whole year? <laughs> this is my contention with my mother, who insists on having strawberries on Christmas Day. I kind of think strawberries are a summer fruit. I associate them with summer. I think it's weird to have to have them on Christmas Day, especially when you have to fly them in from New Zealand for the privilege. 
But if we're talking about things like health, it might well be that food produced in season is also healthier. Because it has better and more nutrients, vitamins, minerals. Forced food, food that is grown in a hothouse environment, that is in an artificial climate, or food that is grown on the other side of the world in their summer and then flown the 20 or thousand miles from New Zealand to the UK, tends to lose a lot of its nutritional value on weight. So it might all come back to this idea that local food is better food. And it's how we define that better that is key. But as a vegan UK climate in winter, pretty much doing vegetables you have are cabbage, occasionally potatoes, and carrots. Yeah. So. And parsnips, and turnips, and celeriac, and lots of other root vegetables. Because we get food from other parts of the world, so we don't have to. <laughs> Ultimately, what you need to do in this debate, slightly different from the other one, where the principles might be easy for us to discover just through our own thought process, is we might need to look at who is affected and why supporting them is the principle that we uphold. Okay? Smallholders, local producers, are very often those people whose livelihoods have been damaged by what we term progress by the industrialization of farming. Tesco, the global supermarket giant, pays less for each pint of milk it buys than it costs to produce that milk. Farmers are forced to sell milk at a loss to Tesco because there is no one else to buy the milk anyway. That's why the European Union has to subsidize dairy farmers to such a degree. It's not because farmers are wasteful. It's not because the European Union is mad. It's because these people without that subsidy would have no livelihood. And that would create an extra burden on us all anyway. But the real problem is the bullying purchasing power of a Tesla Go giant. Being able to set the price, purchase price so low that farmers have no choice. So in protecting individuals who cannot protect themselves, we may have derived a firm principle. Is it generally a duty of government to help those least able to help themselves? Yes. That makes for a good society. Because we're not all born with the same advantages. So it answers one of the problems of the lottery of life. The fact that the society you're born into, the country you're born into, the class you're born into, is never a choice that you get to make. And one of the things that philosophers, moral philosophers, tend to be very concerned with is what we call the concept of moral hazard. Just because you're born rich, white and male doesn't mean you deserve all those things. It's a slightly fatalistic point of view to believe that people are born into the situation that they merit. Moral philosophers are very concerned with the way we can equalize for moral hazard. We can level the playing field a little bit. So it might be one of the firm principles of most established democracies that where government aid is given, it's given in those places where it's most needed, where people are least able to take that action for themselves. Those farmers can't simply change industry because those opportunities don't necessarily exist. So there might be a principle there that government says we help people least able to help themselves. We think modernization techniques, industrialization of food production has harmed particularly small holding farmers. We think those are the most important stakeholders in this debate and the principle we are upholding is one of simple fairness, ladies and gentlemen. We are making life fairer because we know that due to moral hazard, it simply isn't fair for everybody. We're not trying to create an artificially level playing field, but we are trying to smooth out some of the uneven bumps within our society. We also think, as an extra benefit to our policy, that we improve the health of local consumers, and we think it's likely, although not axiomatic, that smallholders are likely to be more organic, and therefore better for the environment. These are other good things that government seeks to do. 
So you might have more than one principle running through your case. It's for you to decide on a strategic question whether you want to promote one single principle, whether you want to promote multiple principles but have focus on one, or whether you think they are equal in terms of value and therefore equally worth promoting. You might think all of them tie in together. You might think that the health issue of the local community is also government helping people who cannot help themselves. Because choice is very often an illusion in a capitalist society. When you go to the supermarket, you might think you have a vast array of choice. But your choice is determined by the things the supermarket wants to give you. And that is determined by the price that they can pay. So you might not have a full choice, but you have a choice within a defined range that is determined for you by economics. We might make, want to make it easier for people in the local community to make better choices. We know that better choices make for better citizens. We proved that in the last debate. Okay? So there are principles that sometimes run through. If we're on the opposition in this debate, then it's possibly true that the effect on developing countries is probably where we want to concentrate our principled argument. Why it's not okay for people in rich, mature, western democracies to ignore the realities of global trade. Why it's not okay for us to artificially prop up inefficient methods of farming at the expense of developing economies who might rely on that trade and their competitive advantage in producing food more cheap. There might be a counter-argument to that, that one of the worst things rich countries can do is buy food from poor countries where there might not be enough food. Does anybody know how much waste we create in the food industry globally every year? Not in terms of tonnage, but in terms of proportion. How much of the food we produce each year globally gets thrown away? Ellie? Isn't it a third? One third. One third of everything we produce never gets eaten by anybody. It gets thrown away. That's quite disgusting. It's also, on an economic level, incredibly inefficient. Okay? As I've already told you, the reason why the EU has to subsidise certain areas of the farming industry isn't because we like to prop up inefficient businesses, it's because we realise that not propping them up would create worse problems. That's not true of all subsidies from the European Union. The common agricultural policy is distorted. It props up farming in some countries more than it does in other countries, for example. It also has an effect on our near neighbours like Turkey, who rely on agricultural trade with the European Union for a significant proportion of their gross domestic product. If we want Turkey to continue to thrive and to remain a more or less stable and secular democracy, that trade might be essential to prevent the government in Turkey from turning more hardline and more against European interests. All these ideas come into play in the same debate, but the way we discover them in this debate is slightly different to the previous one. Studying abroad. How are we going to derive our principles in studying abroad? Well, here we might ask ourselves the question, what is the general purpose of study abroad programs? And then we might want to think of a specific example of a study abroad program to see what principles it seeks to uphold. Okay? So give me an example of a very well-known, common, European study abroad program. Erasmus. Perfect. So we look at the Erasmus program. Also known as the Bologna Accord. Okay? Formulated and signed at Bologna University. The reason Bologna University was chosen? The first university. Oldest university in the world. Single oldest continuous institute of higher education in the world. Older than any of the ancient universities of Scotland, older than Oxford, older than Cambridge. Okay? Bologna has been a seat of higher institution learning since the 11th century. 
1046, in fact, the university was first incorporated. Quite incredible. It's a beautiful place. If you've never been, I urge you to go. If any of you has an interest in linguistics or semiotics, the wonderful Umberto Eco is a lecturer at Bologna University. He sometimes gives public lectures on meaning and significance of language, which are wonderful if you ever get a chance to go and see them. So the Erasmus programme, what is the purpose of the Erasmus programme? What is its stated purpose? We can find that out very easily by Googling it. So we don't need a great store of specific knowledge in order to work through in our preparation time where our principles might be in this particular event. We can think of, okay, study abroad. First it comes to mind Erasmus. What do I do? I Google Erasmus. I find out what they say their mission statement is. Does anybody happen to know? The cultural exchange, the chance to have a a possibility, the chance uh, to have a different point of view of what you're studying from a different kind of experts and different community and different way of thinking. Yeah. Cultural exchange, broader perspective. And they have a third stated aim, which is a shared or common European experience. The idea that living in different European countries teaches us more about the similarities between Europeans rather than the differences, okay? And helps us to understand the individual needs within those countries, etc. Is any one of those individual aims itself a principle? Or are they stepping stones towards a principle? Stepping stones. What are they stepping stones towards, Mia? Towards a uh, better quality of um, education, of uh, having a, a better perspective of life itself. Better For education, you. which gives us... Better citizens. Absolutely <laughs> right. You see where I'm going, please, don't you? Better workforce. Better citizens. Europe is a better place for all when we understand each other. The whole point of the European project, let's not forget, was not an economic arrangement, even though that's how it was first formed. That was not the abiding principle of the Treaty of Rome in 1957. What was the abiding principle of the Treaty of Rome in 1957? Peace in Europe. Peace. Countries that trade with each other rarely go to war with each other. Europe had been ravaged by two very, very destructive conflicts in the space of 20 years, 25 years. The determination for that never to happen again led to the formation of the European Economic Area Agreement, as it was first known. It didn't become the EEC, the European Economic Community, until much later. But the idea that now we would go to war is anathema to most people within the European Union. It is now about what makes us better citizens of a European state. How that cooperation can increase to further the aims of the states within a union. Because we're now not just an economic area. We're a rights-based union as well, where we seek to enforce the provision of rights in those countries which wish to exceed. That's why we place entrance criteria upon them. Our principle, therefore, in studying abroad might well be, quite simply, that it makes people better citizens. It promotes understanding. Understanding might be a good in and of itself. Okay? The idea about peace between nations trading is one that holds very, very strongly. There are two truisms about international conflict, only one of which is true. The first truism, and it's the false one, is that no two functioning democracies have ever gone to war with each other. That is false. Does anybody know which two functioning democracies did once declare war on each other? You can have a guess at one of them because we're involved in every war. Britain, yes. You might dispute whether we're a functional democracy or not, but that's beside the point. But we are involved in every single war. We declared war 
on a functional democracy. Who was it? USA? No. no. USA at the time was a colony. It was illegally stolen. No, no, no. Uh, happy birthday, America. Uh, it didn't become a functional democracy until after the War of Independence. Argentina and... Uh, Argentina was a military junta at the time of the Falklands conflict, not a functional democracy. Germany? Germany? Ireland. Not a functional democracy by the time we went to war with them. Not a functional democracy when we went to war with them, or we weren't. Is this country in Europe? Is this country in Europe? It is a country in Europe, it is a country in the European Union. France? No. No. Spain. No. <laughs> Finland. <laughs> Finland. In World War II, Finland was attacked by both Nazi Germany and subsequently by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union invaded the moment the Finns had defeated the Nazis, thinking they would take advantage of a weak army. They forgot about the Finnish concept of sisu, which means resilience or strength or guts or determination and all those things combined. And the Finns, the plucky little nation that they are, became the only nation to defeat both the Nazis and the Soviets in the space of one winter. When the Soviet yes, it does deserve a round of applause. When the Soviet Union invaded Finland in the winter of 1941, the Finns issued a declaration of war. Because the Soviet Union was part of the Allied powers, any declaration of war against it triggered an automatic declaration of war from London against Helsinki. However, no shots were exchanged between Finnish and British soldiers. So it was a slightly artificial state of war. The second truism about international conflict, which is absolutely true, is no two countries which have a McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other. Now that might indicate that countries that have free trade or open trade policies tend not to go to war with each other, but that might also be because those are the countries that tend to do a lot of trade. Where there is mutual economic interest in the relationship, there tends to be a great disincentive to conflict. Study abroad nowadays isn't about preventing conflict, as I've said. It might be about improving cultural experiences and therefore making us better able to address those issues which affect all Europeans on some level. The competencies that we grant to the European Union are designed to embrace particularly those issues which affect us all equally. That is why, as nation states, we come together and agree those competencies. So our principle, quite easily derived, might be we make better European citizens when European youth study abroad. What might be the principle of the opposition? And this is where we'll finish this lecture. They won't necessarily stay with Europe. That's um, an element of an argument, but it's not a principle. Unjust division of intellectual power around the globe, concentrating it in certain centers like Oxbridge, draining other countries of their intellect, therefore leaving them empty brain and uh, brain undeveloped. Brain drain. Yeah. It might be brain drain. Because there are certain universities, or certain groups of universities, which carry a cachet just in the name. Oxford, Cambridge, the Ivy League schools, MIT, places like that attract a lot of students. They attract the brightest and the best from all countries, and also the best resource. What that means is that the children of the elite of individual countries tend to be educated together at university level. Their experiences become shared. Those are the friends you tend to keep with you throughout your life. If your experience at that level is matched by people who also come from similarly privileged backgrounds, both economically and educationally, we may in fact create a division in the realities of our political elite, those people who tend to become the leaders of countries, and 
to people who they are meant to be leading. They are divorced from the reality of the situation of most of the citizens of their country. A very good example of this is the independence of India and Pakistan and the partition. That deal was signed, not in India, and certainly not in Pakistan. It wasn't signed in London either. It was signed in the Oxford Union Bar, because both of the individuals involved were studying at Oxford at the time. That is mirrored today when we saw after the assassination of Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan that the anointed successor to that political dynasty in Pakistan was her son, Bilawal. Bilawal was an undergraduate, not in Pakistan, but in Oxford. And suddenly all the media focus about what was happening in Pakistan was concentrated again on Oxford University. So it might be a brain drain, it might be a wider problem that we create this division in realities between our political class and our more ordinary class of people. That in itself might be a problem if we want to have what? Better citizens. Better citizens, better governance, better choices for better people. Ultimately, many of the principles that you can derive in whatever debate come back to a similar idea. We want to make things better for people. It's up to you, as a proposition or opposition, to define what better means in your context, in your paradigm, what is a good citizen, what is a better citizen? What is a good government, what is a better government? Some principles are almost universal. Fairness is something we should always seek to uphold. But fairness can be interpreted in different ways. Equality of treatment does not always lead to equality of outcome. We might wish to consider which is more important. If we treat everybody equally, that harms who? Minorities, disabled people on a physical level. If everybody's given equal treatment, and no special treatment, then people who require more assistance don't get it. Unfair treatment might result in fair outcomes, though. Putting ramps into buildings so that people can have wheelchair access is inequality of treatment to ensure an equality of outcome. So fairness can be turned around from side to side. It's up to you, depending on whether you're proposition or opposition, to determine what makes a good citizen for you. Is it about an individual empowering themselves? Is it about a state giving them the tools to be empowered? Or is it, on some level, about the state recognising that some people require more assistance than others? It may be a balance of all three of those things. In your research, and that's what I'm going to talk about in my next elective, is how to research effectively, you should be able to determine from that research where these principles exist, how they are supported by action, and why they are important to maintain. Do we have any questions? In which case, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time.